Welcome back, you mischievous little child, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today's tour takes us to the delightful world of Secret of Mana. We're going to travel throughout the game and look at spots that I think are stunning, cute, or just flat out bizarre. The hero, Randy, is playing with his friends somewhere he's not supposed to. He loses his footing and falls down a massive waterfall, landing in a small pool at the foot of it. If you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll know I'm a sucker for a good first screen in a game, where you finally finish watching the opening sequence and get to move around for the first time. The cheerful vibes were already established with the upbeat music, but the environment down here brings it to a whole other level. It all feels so carefree. And the pixel art is beautiful. The water shimmering in the pool you're standing in, the rocks, the flowers, they had some great artists on this project. And the game came out midway through the Super Nintendo's lifespan. You can see a massive jump in quality between this and Final Fantasy V that came out the year before. The art is a big draw to this game. It really is just beautiful at times. Randy's home village Potos isn't a stunning beauty or anything. It has a more mundane beauty. Green grass, chill music, people of all ages meandering about. I think it's respectable when a game tries to blaze its own path and buck tradition, but it takes a lot of skill to know when to rely on tropes. They did that here, and it really works. This is an idealized version of a JRPG home village. A few buildings for you to enter. Not much to see this early on, of course, but you can still go in. Could I live in a house with just this stuff? Maybe. I like this little flower patch with a rock path around it. Overall, this is just a nice village to be around. Unfortunately, you won't be here long. Randy is banished from the village, and an adventure is pushed upon him. What's really sad is that you never get to re-enter Potos Village. Walking to the next screen and going back, the guard still says you're banished. Even here, on my save right before tackling the final boss, he still says the same line. Now while Randy does technically return here during the end credits, the fact that you, the player, never get to walk around in the village again is kind of a bummer. All you can visit is this little corner of the village, looking longingly at the place you grew up in. But we mustn't linger in the past. Let's turn our eyes forward to the future and begin this long and arduous journey. Your first destination is the Water Palace. It towers above you, giving a hint to the scale of the situation you just stumbled into. Walking in, it feels even more imposing. I'm also a sucker for ritualistic areas and games. Think of the Temple of Time from Ocarina of Time. You feel the history in places like this, and the scale is almost always impressive. Like you come in here and below you is a black void. Just how deep is that? How far down do these waterfalls pour? It all feels so important. Whoa, I didn't really notice this until just now, but the perspective on this waterfall feels weird. I'm trying to imagine the placement of these two ledges in a 3D space, and I actually can't. The way the waterfall flows from the top to the bottom one doesn't look right. It reminds me of those old-school illusions like the Penrose Stairs. I had to actually look up footage of the 3D remake just to see how modern developers reinterpreted this and… wow. The waterfall flows into the void below, not onto the pool on the lower ledge. Do you see what I mean? Does this look weird to anyone else or just me? I need to know if making this series is driving me crazy or not. Pandora is the first big town you come across, and it does feel appropriately big. Big enough to make you feel like you've left the tiny world of your home village, but small enough to not be overwhelming. 
Of importance here, though, is the castle. Wouldn't be a Super Nintendo JRPG without a castle. Huh, look at that. There's a little drain in the river at the foot of the castle. It's a super cool detail I noticed while writing this. It's one of those things that most people definitely won't notice, but for the people that do, it shows that the developers cared. They put in weird, tiny details like that just to make the world a little bit more believable. Castles are usually a good litmus test for whether a world is believable. A good castle will have a handful of rooms that aren't a throne room. Like a kitchen, a dining room, bedrooms. This one, uh, doesn't have a lot of those. And the layout is kinda weird. To get to the throne room, you know, the main room of a castle in these types of games, you gotta go zigzagging all over the place, up and down floors to eventually reach what is usually just a straight ahead from the main entrance. So Pandora's castle isn't the most believable castle in video games. It does have this cute little guard bedroom though, so that's one point in its favor. At the end of an annoying forest maze that is admittedly pretty beautiful, you step on a teleporter and you're taken to a witch's castle. We're no longer in a chill forest, we're in a spooky black void. It's super ominous in here. I think it's solely because of the fact that there's no background. It makes you feel like you entered a whole other plane of existence where a witch just happens to hang out. There is something charming about the castle architecture, the green grass, and the blackness below. It's a nice combination. The Forest of Seasons is a peculiar place. You arrive in the snowy part of the forest. I appreciate the change of scenery. All the environments we've seen so far have been drenched in green, so all the snow breaks up things a bit. Going south leads you to a greener area with pink-leaved trees. I think I see what they're doing. To the east is a similar environment, but with green-leafed trees. Going to the north and, yep, we're in the fall. It's a spot that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense existing in real life, but it's a great video game place. Obviously, an RPG like this wouldn't really want to go for actual seasons based on a real or fictional calendar, as that's just more trouble than it's worth. But the aesthetic difference between the seasons is still a unique look, and it's obvious they wanted to work that into the game somehow. I think this is a pretty fun way to include it. Close to the Forest of Seasons is a mountain. There's a hole in the side of it. Through that, you can travel a very short distance to another hole that leads you back out. Going through that puts you in this beautiful scene. Being in a forest under tall trees is such a cool aesthetic, and I love how they convey that here with shadows casted on the ground from leaves above. There's a little village set up here inhabited by friendly mushrooms. Their main building isn't much to write home about, but I do want to show off something. Note the flooring they use throughout here. It looks like hay, maybe? A little bit of wood paneling here, but they mostly use hay. But you go upstairs to this bedroom and there's a little patch of grass. That's weird. Ground level was obviously on the first floor. Why is there grass up here? Okay, now that I pointed it out, it feels like less of an interesting observation than I thought. Moving on. The King Mushroom sends you on a short quest to find a baby dragon in some nearby caves. Eventually you find him and, wow, this is a pretty cave. It kind of reminds me of the cave where you find the Quadra Magic Materia in Final Fantasy VII. It's not really sandy like that one was, but the little spotlights are reminiscent of it. I love hidden away caves in games, and this is definitely one of them. Next spot isn't super mind-blowing or anything, but I felt like I had to point it out, since I talk about areas like this a lot. Not long after arriving in a nearby desert, you discover a sand ship. Unfortunately, things don't go your way, and the party is split up. Though once you gather your party and defeat the boss for the area, you can never return here. Same with the little area you're placed in after defeating that boss. The only escape is by talking to one of the guards and they take you out themselves. And it's not like I'd really want to come back here, but the fact that I can't makes me wish I could. 
This next spot I genuinely wasn't expecting. There's been a lot of fantasy elements so far, and my perception of the game's setting had mostly been locked in by now. That is, until I came across Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Like, literally. This is Rudolph. That's his name, there's his red nose. And he's talking about his master? Oh man. You beat the boss of this section and, sure enough, that's Santa Claus. It's hard to describe why this threw me off. I guess it'd be one thing if I was playing like, I don't know, Grand Theft Auto, and it's revealed that, yep, Santa Claus is real in the world of Grand Theft Auto. GTA is so obviously based on real life, that would feel like a bizarre reveal. But this is a fantastical world, full of magic and bizarre creatures. Why does Santa being real in this game feel weird? I don't know. It's kind of funny that you're able to just be in his house. Like, this is a super normal living space. I would have expected Santa Claus to have a bit more going on. Though maybe he lives a humble life, and this is all he needs. I think the snowman in his front yard is cute. This little room in the fire palace stuck out to me for whatever reason. I think I beat the dungeon by the time I made this save, so there's no enemies in here. But even when there were enemies, it just felt weird. Like, it's a maze, but it's not challenging at all. And it ends with this chest in a stained glass window above. This is one of those things that's hard to put into words, but it just feels weird. South Town and North Town perhaps feel the most modern out of all the locations in the game. Look at the exterior of the buildings. The wallpaper, the flooring. It's not necessarily right out of our world, but it feels like the closest you can get in a game like this especially when compared to the other, more rustic homes in other villages. Something that immediately struck me upon walking into Southtown for the first time was the grass. I could tell it was different from the other grass in the game. I hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to the grass texture before, but going back and looking at it now, it's definitely different enough to make you notice it. I guess what they were going for here is super well-manicured grass, compared to a perhaps more rough and unkempt grass elsewhere. Like, the Empire can definitely afford to keep this looking absolutely perfect. North Town is bustling. This is perhaps the busiest location in the game, and there's a lot to get distracted by. A ton of people to talk to and buildings to enter. There is one building that has a bit more going on, though. You go in the front door here. Upstairs go to the far left side, then downstairs, downstairs again, and boom, you're in the resistance base. Pretty well hidden, right? Well, except for the fact that the lady in the front room kinda gives away that the base is here, but she's trying her best. Secluded little spot down here. It is unfortunate it's connected to the sewer, we're literally one door away. I'm sure this spot wouldn't be so chill if the game had smell -o vision Another heavily populated town is the Gold Isle. It's a town that's completely covered in gold. The ground, the foliage, the building exteriors, the building interiors, literally everything gold. You know, another thing I just noticed while writing this script, I'm pretty sure this reuses the same textures as South and North Town, only recolored. Here's some side-by-sides of colorful textures and their gilded counterparts. I'm surprised I didn't notice that early on, considering you come here not long after the two Empire Towns. Though this is another town controlled by them, so I guess it makes sense that they'd use the same architecture and all. It's just gold now. A particular spot of interest, though, is at the southwest corner of town. There's a little overhang, a thing you don't see that often in towns like this. It leads into this tiny pocket of space. What's this all about? I checked every wall to make sure there wasn't a hidden entrance, but nope. No items, no NPCs, no anything. I wonder if something was planned for this cubby of the world, because it feels like something's missing. I feel like a lot of the time when you see spots like this, cut content often does explain it. Who knows though, maybe this was the level designer's intention. Maybe they really wanted this semi-enclosed empty area to exist, so they made it. If that's the case, good for them. Great spot. 
the Moon Palace has a beautiful aesthetic. As you approach it, you see stars litter the desert ground. At the north end of this screen, you see stars, planets, galaxies, nebulas? I don't know my astronomy. Either way, stuff I don't think you should be seeing on the ground in a desert. But it's a cool look, so I'll give it a pass. The blue background changes to black as you go up to the next screen. I gotta say, it really catches the eye. There's something about the look of outer space being brought to Earth that's so gripping to me. It reminds me of Star Hill from Super Mario RPG, a game I covered some months back. Even more so when you get to the actual Moon Palace. You're walking directly on the space-like background, over top all the stars flickering in the distance. It's actually super confusing in here. You can walk in any direction you want, and it eventually loops. You just have to wander around enough to actually find the exit. This place is pretty cool, but I still prefer Star Hill. The Mana Palace is where the story starts to really ramp up. Underneath it is the underground city, and I super dig the vibes here. It's very beach-like, with sand and coral all over the place. This room is a standout to me. It really just has everything. This is where you fight a boss, but once it dies, there's nothing to see in here. There's a lot of boss rooms like that in the game. This is one of my favorites, though. The texture work is just super top-notch here. Like, look at the northern wall. So much detail. Going down the steps after the boss room, the underground city gets a bit more… bizarre. Now we're all industrial for some reason. It feels super high-tech and completely disconnected from the natural sandy cave just one floor above it. Though this does feel like more of an underground city than those caves. This is a pretty long dungeon going through all the caves and then these tunnels, so thankfully they give you a safe room part way through. Some NPCs are here, so you can upgrade your weapons and heal up. Though so when did they get here? I like the floor texture in this area. It kind of reminds me of prismarine blocks from Minecraft. I love this particular shade of blue. That's enough of this room for now. Uh, that's a subway. I never thought a game having a subway would be as equally shocking as a game having Santa Claus. It's one of those things where you have this perception of the world in your head. You've seen a lot of what the game's had to offer by now. You roughly get a feel for how far it's willing to go in terms of setting. And then it just throws a subway at you. I guess it is an underground city, but still, it seems like such a modern thing. I just… whatever. Subways exist in this world? Santa Claus exists in this world. Sure, fine, let's just get out of here. The story is starting to wrap up as we approach the Pure Land. This was an area once shrouded by mana, but thanks to the Mana Fortress sucking it all up, you're now free to enter. This really does feel like a place that's been sealed away for a long time. I think the trees layered on top of the characters play a large part in selling that. Like maybe the path wasn't obscured long ago, but as the years have gone on, they've become overgrown and covered the path. This screen is my favorite in the area. The shallow waters, green grass, and subdued rock texture make this spot feel super welcoming, despite all the nasty creatures trying to kill you. It actually kind of reminds me of the areas towards the beginning of the game. They evoke similar feelings of peacefulness in me, but they still do have their separate vibes. This whole section is building up to you reaching the mana tree. It's something you've been hearing about throughout the game. In fact, it's the tree featured in the game's beautiful box art. Which is only a fraction of the full artwork. I'm not a huge art guy, but this piece truly resonates with me. The details are insane here. Zooming in, there's so much going on. Everything is so intricate. Zooming out, the whole piece comes together. It feels so marvelous, awe-inspiring. The party standing down here are practically amoebas before the massive tree. It really captures the curiosity and wonder of going on an adventure and coming across something truly stunning. Needless to say, I was excited to finally visit the mana tree myself. You get a short glimpse of it during the opening credits, but I wanted to truly be at the foot of it myself. 
to feel the scale and wonder that this artwork conveys. Without further ado, let's visit the Mana Tree. Well, that's underwhelming. All you can see is the base of the tree and a little bit of the ground around it. I was ready for the game to hit it out of the park. The pixel art has been beautiful throughout the game. I thought they were going to go all out on this. And it just looks like a couple of slightly big trees clumped together. To be fair, this is a Super Nintendo game. The console does have its limitations. It's just... I was expecting more. Maybe that's on me, I don't know. I still kind of like the spot. The moment you have here during the story is impactful, and the mind does a pretty good job at mentally expanding this to be the beautiful scene featured in this artwork. With the power granted to you from the mana tree, you're ready to take on the final dungeon, the mana fortress. It perfectly nails that industrial vibe. I feel like that was a big trope for RPGs at the time, the game ending on a dungeon with a mechanical style. It feels particularly appropriate for this game, because so many of the environments are beautiful renditions of just nature. Plain old trees and grass and water, everything pure in this world. And here's the big bad mana fortress, with all these metal floors, pipes, and nonsensical doodads and gizmos. Seriously, what even is this thing? It's always a good feeling to overcome dungeons like this, and protect the natural state of the world. Inside is just nonsensical. Look at all these flashing green lights in the walls. The blue lights here, the purple lights on the ground. They were really going for the complete opposite of a calming forest here. I'm getting a headache just imagining standing in this room. It's overstimulating. Towards the end of the dungeon is this room. This is the last room before the final boss. Stepping on that green square will teleport you to the fight. But you don't have to do that just yet. This room basically asks you, Yo, you sure you're ready to do this? Maybe you aren't, so you fiddle around in your inventory, making sure everything's in order. Or maybe you look around a bit to mentally prepare. So much technology down there. It looks really far away. The Mana Fortress must be huge. Enough dilly-dallying. Time to finish this. Whack the final boss a few times, beat him. Whack the final final boss a few times, beat him. Credits roll, the end. Say, does this screen count as a spot? I only got into older RPGs in the past couple years, and I noticed a lot of them will have a the end screen that they hang on until you reset the console, rather than kicking you back to the main menu. I like that. It kind of forces you to sit and ruminate. You get to mentally tie a bow on the whole experience while listening to this beautiful song and looking at this cute scene. This may be the end of the game, but it's not the end of the video. We have one more spot to look at, my favorite in the game. Before I show it off though, drop your favorite spot in the comments. I'm curious what areas really resonated with you guys. Alright, welcome to the Lofty Mountains. With a name like The Lofty Mountains, you know you're going to be in for a great view. You start at the bottom and slowly climb your way up. Once you get to see the first background layer, it's all trees. I mean, it's a mishmash of green and brown pixels, but you can only assume they're trees. You are really high up, remember? Reaching the other side of the mountain where you can further ascend, you see a little river in the distance. Starting to see a bit more of the landscape. I like it, I like it reaching the very top of the mountain, and you don't get to see much more. The very tip-top of the screen, you can see the trees of the forest fade away, but that's it. Though there is an interesting detail, or bug, maybe. You decide. Take note of the background layer here. Now I'll enter the cave, and now I'll leave. For some reason, now we're high in the sky. Above the clouds, actually. Let's descend the mountain a bit. Here we go. This is the spot I wanted to find. Being able to see the trees below you, mountains in the distance, and skies above you all in one screen is what makes this spot beautiful. It kind of encapsulates the vibes of the game. This is such a grand view, and it really feels like you're going on an adventure. 
You started out in such a humble little village, and now you have this vantage point, looking out upon such a wide swath of land. It's simply beautiful. Check out either of these videos up next. I'm about to go full bore on Final Fantasy VII content with Rebirth coming out, so get subscribed to see all that. It'll be juicy. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.